our Bibles tonight and let's open up to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Man, we're rolling right along through this book. Already in the fifth chapter. I say we're rolling along. Some of you would say we're probably crawling through it, but we're getting through it. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 8 to verse 14. Ephesians 5, verse 8 to verse 14. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit, or light, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come now to the reading, the studying of your word, we we pray, Father, that you would guide us into all truth, that you would illuminate our minds God, let the soil of our heart be prepared to receive the good seed of the word. God, let it find good soil. Let it bring forth fruit in our life. And God, change us, encourage us, transform us. And Lord, do your work of sanctification in our life as we look at the word of God. Do that tonight, I pray. Anoint me and anoint your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue our study in this great book of Ephesians, we, for the last several weeks, have been looking at this section of how it is we are to live out our Christian faith. What, is the, what does the Word of God say? How does it say we are to live in light of all that we have received by the grace of God? And he says in Ephesians 5 and verse 1, and we looked at this last week, that we are to be imitators of God as dear children. We are to be followers of God as dear children. That we are to live our lives following Him, conforming our life to Him, living as Christ lived. We we read in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we are to be holy. Why? Because He is holy. We are to be holy. Why? Because He is holy. And we are to be imitators of God as dear children. The the Word of God tells us to be holy. Our God is holy. The Spirit that lives on the inside of us is the Holy Spirit. And so we are to live lives of holiness. We see tonight what God's Word says. And he tells us that we are now the light. We are light in the Lord. And he begins in verse 8 by showing us a contrast of what we once were before. Look at this. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul says, You were once, you were once darkness. You see in this statement, this is, this is past tense. And the word there, were, is an emphatic. It means that this is something that you used to be. You were at one time darkness, but now you are, are no longer to be classified in that way. And I love these statements that we've already looked at some, but I want us to, go, I want us to look at these statements that have that word were in them. They have that phrase, were, because they describe something that is past, that that is not to describe us now. It describes what we used to be. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, and you know this verse because we've looked at it. But it says here, here's, here's one of those were statements, and you he made alive who were dead. In trespasses and sins. 
in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. There we were dead, there we were children of wrath. But then he goes on, he says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. We were, that's, it's a description of what we used to be. And then he says again, if you go down to verse 12, he says that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were, right? We at one time were darkness. We were sometimes, it says, ye were sometimes darkness. But now you are children of light. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is found in Titus chapter 3. And I want you to turn with me there. These are those were statements. What we used to be. Titus chapter 3. It says in verse... Three, look at this. For we ourselves were also, were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's what we used to be. We were that way. That's what we used to be. But then he says in verse four, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We were once that way, but not anymore. Then we see this again, and we read this one last week. And this is also one of those, this is also one of those verses where we ought to be able to shout when we read it, Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we looked at this last week, it says in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But look at verse 11. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were sanctified, but you were justified. In the name, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That's what we were, right? That's these were statements. That's who we were. It's past. That's not who we are now. At one time, yes, it, that's who we were. There's one more I want us to look at in First Peter. Turn with me to First Peter. Chapter 2. First Peter 2. It says in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at this. Who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's, it describes what we once were. We were once darkness. Ye were sometimes darkness. Ye says you were once 
darkness. Then he goes on and, and we see there that darkness, God's word, when it, when it speaks of darkness, there's really two meanings to what it's talking about. To be in darkness has two aspects. There's intellectual darkness that's speaking of ignorance, of being in the dark, not having certain knowledge. And then there's moral darkness where you are living a life of sin, living in an unholy life. That's what it is to be in darkness, to be ignorant, to be without certain knowledge, and to be living an unholy life. We were once darkness. We were ignorant of the truth of the gospel. And we were slaves to sin. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 34, He who sins is a slave of sin. You and I were in bondage to sin. We were under the domain of darkness, the dominion of it. And you and I in and of ourselves could not get ourselves free from that. Amen? We could not deliver ourselves from that. We were in bondage. We were slaves of sin. And Jesus said, a slave does not abide in in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And then he goes on and says, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We once were darkness. We were slaves of sin. We were ignorant of God, alienated from him. We were Darkness. We see this contrast of darkness and light in the Old Testament, and there's a woe that's pronounced. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah 5, you'll see within this chapter he pronounces woes, these woes. Woe. But he says in verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Darkness in the Word of God speaks of that ignorance, being without knowledge and living under the domination, the bondage of sin and Satan. We read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, that He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He has delivered us from the domain, from the power of darkness and brought us in, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He removed us from one kingdom and placed us in another kingdom. We were once darkness. We, that's what we once were. But then He says, now we are light in the Lord. We are light We're no longer ignorant or blind to the truth of the gospel. We're no longer bound up in sin, no longer under the dominion of darkness, loving the darkness. We no longer live in that way, but now we are light in the Lord. We are light in the Lord. Scripture speaks a lot describing God as being the light or being light. David said in Psalm 27 and verse 1, The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Isaiah 49 and verse 6, speaking of Jesus, it says that He will be a light to the Gentiles. In John 1 and verse 9, it says that was that He is that true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. We read in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, 
Psalm 119, speaking of the word of the Lord, it says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And now you and I in the Lord, we are that light. We have his light in us and now we shine that light. We are the light in the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, You are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden. You and I are light now in the Lord. And we are to walk as children of light. We're to walk now as children of light. Those who have been brought out of darkness into his marvelous light, we are to now live in the light of that. We are to walk that out. We are to live in the light. And this is exactly what John the Apostle said in 1 John chapter 1. Let's look at this together. 1 John chapter 1. It says in verse 5, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all Sin. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We were once darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. And then we see in verse 9, he shows us the fruit of light or the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now here's the fruit of the light. Here's what that looks like. He says here that as we walk in the light, here's, here's what is manifested. The fruit of the Spirit is in all. The first thing he says there is goodness. The fruit of walking in the light is goodness. Goodness there is moral excellence. The saying, there's a saying that you'll hear said, and it's partially true that he did not come to make bad people good, but he came to make dead people come to life. That's partially true, but you certainly need to understand he did come to make people who were bad good people. Yes, he came to make those who were spiritually dead alive, but he certainly also came to make bad people good. Because the fruit of the light is goodness. Goodness is moral excellence. We read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's look at this together. First Thessalonians 5. It says, verse 15, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. You Pursue what is good, what is morally excellent, what is good, as God deems it as good. That's what we pursue. And the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. Jesus in Acts chapter 10, when Peter was preaching to the household of Cornelius, he spoke of Jesus. He said he went about doing Good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Jesus went about doing good. Titus chapter 2, it says in verse 13, 
It speaks of looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior who gave himself for us that he might purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. Goodness. He did came, come to make people who were at one time bad into good people. Morally excellent people. Amen? It's a description of Barnabas in the book of Acts. It says that he was a good man. He was a good man. Amen. And every Christian, you ought to be able to describe every Christian as being a good man or a good woman. Morally excellent. Not perfect. Not perfect or, or somebody that doesn't have their warts and all those things, but somebody that is good. And then he says the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of light is in all goodness. And then he says righteousness. Righteousness. This has to do with our relationship with God. We in Christ, the moment you believed on Jesus, you were justified. You received justification by faith. That word justification is a legal term that means you were declared righteous. The moment you believed on Jesus, it goes beyond just that forgiveness or atonement. It is a legal declaration that you stand in the presence of God righteous. At God, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21... For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That my sin, my debt, the, my iniquity was placed upon him. He took it, he took my iniquity, and his righteousness was then given to me as if I lived his life. He became... Sin for us on the cross. God treated him like it were us. So now God treats us like we are him. And so right now, if you are saved, you are righteous in the sight of God. You are justified. When you and I die, we will go straight into the presence of God. We will not go into a place called purgatory where we will burn off the remainder of our uncleanness. Where the stains that are still left of our unworthiness will be burned off. For some people, it could be millions of years in purgatory according to that doctrine. But that's not what the Word of God teaches because our righteousness is not our own. It's the righteousness of Christ. And right now, I have His righteousness. I'm clothed in His righteousness. Praise God. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? I stand blameless in His presence. How? Not because of anything I have done, but because of what Christ did. Amen? And those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. How? Because of Christ. How do I endure to the end? Because of my own exertion, my own willpower, my own ability? Absolutely not. Because if that were the case, I, I would probably have already fallen away. And you would too. Right? It's Him. Praise God. But the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness. 
But not only do we have his imputed righteousness, now, now we live. We live a righteous life. It's the fruit of being in the light. If we're walking in the light, we're going to bear the fruit of being in that light. We're going to live a righteous life. We're going to live a life of righteousness. John makes this really plain. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2 and verse 29. He says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who, is, who practices righteousness is born of him. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. We live a righteous life. We practice righteousness. We live that out because we're walking in the light as he is in the light. And the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of light, depending on what translation you're reading, is in all goodness, righteousness, and the last one that mentions there is truth. Truth, honesty, trustworthiness, reliability, integrity, all of these things. The Word of God, the, the, Jesus is called the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. The Word of God is truth. And so if we're walking in the light, we're going to bear the fruit of that light, which is walking in truth. We, we ch bear this out. We're truth. We walk in truth, as opposed to lies, deception, hypocrisy. And then he says in verse 10, and here's an aspect of growing, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, or proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Finding out, this, this speaks of growing, of finding out, proving what is acceptable to the Lord, what pleases the Lord. As we now walk in the light in the Lord, as we walk as light, and more and more light comes into our life, we are more and more transformed to discern what pleases the Lord. As more and more light comes in, we are now able to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The more and more the light of the Word gets into your heart, the more you will be able to know what pleases the Lord. When you dust your house, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you dust your house, you get the furniture polish, you go and you go to every piece of wood in your house, you move the stuff off and then you dust it, then you put the stuff back if you do it the right way, right? You do all that, and then the noontime sun comes out, and you go to the curtains, and you pull back the curtains, and you look at what you just dusted, and you see a spot there where there's dust. You see a spot there, right? You see little places that you missed when you were dusting once the light began to shine in. And it's the same with the Word of God. The more the light begins to shine, the more you and I begin to walk in the light, He begins to reveal, hey, there's a little stuff over here. There's some stuff over here. And so what do we do? We conform our life to the light. We get our life lined up. We find out what is pleasing to the Lord, and we line up our life with that, right? Finding out... What is pleasing to the Lord? Conforming our life. Walking in such a way. As Romans 1 or 12 it says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that acceptable and perfect will of God that you may know the will of God that you may prove it that you may discern it 
And as we walk in the light, as we expose more light to our hearts, we find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Amen? If you are a habitual student of Scripture, an habitual reader of the Word, and you come to it with a humble heart to receive everything that it says, you're not standing in judgment over it, you're not coming to the Word and going, well, with unbelief. You're coming to it because now the Spirit on the inside of you longs. It brings you to the Word. And when you come to it and you see something in it, it's, it's like a mirror. It really does show you who you are. Amen? It does show you. If you're a student of the Word, the Word of God will show you who you are. And he'll show you areas you need to lovingly, graciously, he'll reprove you. He'll keep your heart humble. Because you know God's desire is that we make it all the way to the end. That's his design. That's his complete. He does not want anybody to perish. The minute you got saved, Jesus plays for keeps. And you know that making it all the way to the end, there are means by which He has ordained that you make it all the way to the end. That you make it in faith. You make it all the way to the end. There's means. Not only does He determine the end, what He wants to happen, but He determines the means. And one of those means of grace is the Word of God. That's one of those means. That's one of those means by which he brings you all the way in. Church attendance is another one of those means of grace. Prayer is another one of those means of grace. Fellowship with other believers is another means of grace. Communion, the Lord's Supper, is another one of those means of grace by which grace is given when we remember what the Lord did on Calvary. There's grace in that. There, there is a power, not in in that to make you righteous, but a grace that comes along with that. Think about it. Every time we take communion, it's special to me. Right? Doesn't it do something because you're going back? That's, a, that's grace. It's the same with the Word of God. It's a means. And God has ordained the means by which you endure. And I would dare to say it will be it would be hard for a man to backslide and fall away who's praying and reading his Bible continually. It, it'll be hard. In fact, I, I believe it's impossible for a truly converted man to ever fall away if he's continually feeding on the Word and going to the Lord in prayer. If you were to do, if you were to do an interview or take a poll of people that fell away from the Lord, people that fell out of the fellowship of the church, you were to ask them, what was your prayer life like at that time and what was your Bible reading like? And I would dare to say, there's no way a man was habitually reading the Word of God and fell away from God. It is a means of grace. It is a means. God ordains the end. He ordains the end, but He also gives the means by which you make it. Amen? And so when you pick up this book, yeah, it's paper, it's got leather, or bonded leather, or paperback, and it's ink on a page. When you look at that, when you look at that, the, the, the words, the meaning of it, the, that is given to us by God as a means to build up our faith, to keep us humble, to keep us pure, right? To renew our mind, so we find out what is acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. And then he says in verse 11, he says, he gives us the purpose of the light, in Ephesians 11, he says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them or reprove them. He says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Have no partnership with them. 
Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. We are now light. We once were darkness. Now we are not to participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, the things that we once did. To participate with those things marked by sin and ignorance and things associated with the kingdom of God's or the kingdom of darkness is to live in such a way as if you were still in darkness. God's word now tells us, have no fellowship with them. Paul says this again in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and he says it a little bit more emphatically. And let's look at it, 2 Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians six and verse fourteen. He says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? What communion has light with darkness? What fellowship is there? And what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. What fellowship has light with darkness? What communion? Jesus, in John chapter 17, this is where we get this phrase from. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. And this is what Jesus prayed in John 17. I want you to look at it with me. In John 17... Jesus is praying, he's interceding for the disciples and not just for them. Within the context, we know he's also interceding for us. And he says in verse 14, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Look at what he says in verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus says, I... I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. And so we are in the world, but we are not of the world. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its savor, it is good for nothing. You and I are light in the Lord. We are light If we begin to walk and have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, we literally have no purpose. None. If our saltiness loses its savor, we have no function in the world. But to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. And so we are not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness... We're not to participate in them. We're not to vicariously live through the darkness of other people. So we're not entertained by the darkness, right? We're not entertained living vicariously through the dark deeds of unbelievers. 
Because we're not to participate or have any fellowship with them. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. So we can also bring people out of the world to Christ. But if we're in darkness, we can't bring people out of darkness because we're in the darkness ourselves. He tells us here that we are rather to expose them or to reprove them. Instead of participating in it, we are to reprove it, to expose it. And this is what darkness does, or light does to darkness. It reveals. And there are several ways that you and I reprove or expose darkness. And one of them is simply just in how we live our life. If you are a believer, a sanctified child of God, your life your life will be a rebuke to people that are different. You won't even have to say a word. You won't even have to open up your mouth. When you're around an unbeliever, and I'm sure you have had this experience, you irritate people by not even doing anything, just by simply living your life different than they live. Right? So you expose it. You show it for what it is. By how you live. By walking uprightly before the Lord. In some instances, you don't even have to say a word to expose the darkness. Just living holy in comparison to how they're living will expose. But then there are times when we are to reprove or to expose with an open rebuke, and evil has to be called evil. It has to. We have to call evil evil. You have to say it. Because that is the function of the light. It exposes. It shows it for what it is. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the martyr that was killed in Nazi Germany, was the one of the few pastors in Nazi Germany that opposed Adolf Hitler. And subsequently he was hanged by the Nazis. But he said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. And so we expose we don't participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, rather expose them. And then he says in verse 12, For it is shameful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. There are things that are so shameful, disgusting, that even to speak of them, even to bring them up, is shameful. Even to rebuke them, to point out how their sin is that they do in secret, even that is shameful. And then he says in verse 13, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. We see light exposes, it manifests what is in the darkness. That's what light does. It lights up, it reveals. Light by its very nature reveals. I remember, and I believe I've told you this story, but when we went on vacation, it's probably been... I think it's been over a decade now. We went down to Florida and drove all night. Got down there about midnight. And the place that we were renting off a snowbird that during the summer stayed up in Ohio. And so they had this open for people to rent in the summer. So we went down there on vacation. We got there about midnight, never been there before. Completely different surroundings. Walked in, flipped on the light, and saw about ten cockroaches just flee. Run under the... 
refrigerator, run under the oven. What made him flee? When I flipped that light on, right? It revealed what was there. It showed you what was there. I know what you're thinking. Did we stay there? Yeah, we stayed there. I'm so glad Michelle did not flip out and say we're not staying here. Because it was really cheap. We got a good deal on that place. But the light made manifest what was there. And that's what the Word of God says. But all things are exposed, are manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is the light. It reveals. We are the light in the Lord. We don't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We expose them. We let our light shine. We let it shine. By living a holy life, by speaking the truth, by walking in purity, that is letting the light of God shine through you by communicating the gospel. Jesus said in John chapter 3, Why do some people not believe? Why did people, even in his day, when Christ incarnate walked the earth, not believe? Why do they not believe now? When the word of God is preached, is is it an intellectual problem? No, it's not. Here's what the problem is. In John chapter 3, verse 18, he says, He who believes in him is not condemned... He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. People love darkness. They love it. They love their sin. Not only are they in bondage to it, but they love it. And then it says, verse 20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Everyone practicing evil hates the light until they're brought to a place of repentance, right? Until they're brought to a place where they hate the darkness and they realize, I need a Savior, I need a Redeemer, and they call upon His name. And then the description would be given that Paul gave in verse 8, you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And then he ends in verse 14 of Ephesians 5, and he says, Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Here's this call that the Word of God gives. This call to salvation. He uses the same language from the book of Isaiah chapter 6. 60 and verse 1 and 2 where it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. Arise and shine, for your light has come. He says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Many commentators that I read when I was studying this believe they said that this was a hymn that they would sing when people were being baptized in the early church. That this was a hymn that they sung As people were being baptized, arise or awake, you who sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. It's also a call for us as Christians to awake, and not only to awake, but to stay awake, right? To stay awake. It's what Paul said in Romans 13, now it is... It's high time to awake out of slumber, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. 
He says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. We are called to walk as the light of the world. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That's what you are. You realize that? That's what you are. That's what I am. That's what you are. You are light in the Lord. That's what you are. Right? You. You watching online, that's what you are. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Let your light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. Amen? Don't let Satan blow it out. Whatever, I think that's what it says. Snuff it out. Amen? I'm going to let it shine. Walk as the light. Amen? Amen. Let's be the light. Be the light. When you get up and go to work tomorrow, be the light. When you interact with your lost loved ones, be the light. In all your interaction, be the light. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't participate with them. Have no communion with them, with, with the darkness. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. We glorify you, Father. Lord, thank you that we were once darkness. We were. That's what we used to be, but not any longer. We are now light in the Lord. Lord, help us to walk as children of the light. God, help us. For the fruit of the light is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out. What is acceptable to you, Lord? Help us, finding out what is pleasing to you. God, help us to walk in that light. And Lord, help us to be the light to those in darkness, that we may win them out of the dominion of Satan and bring them into your kingdom. God, let our light shine before men. Help us to walk that out. Help us to be the light that you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.